Well, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 this evening. We did end last week at verse 1 because technically verse 1 of chapter 7 goes with chapter 16. Uh, and we'll actually, we'll begin there. Paul says in the beginning of chapter 7, he says, since we have these promises. Well, the promises were in chapter 16, and he was referring back. And then whenever they split them up in the 1600s and chapters and verses, for some reason they had the rest of the chapter 7 in a whole different direction. So let's go back and we'll talk about the promises that Paul is talking about at the beginning of this. And that's in chapter 6, verses 16, 17, and 18. These are the promises. He says, What agreement can a temple of God make with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will live and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, get away from them and separate yourselves from them, declares the Lord, and do not touch anything unclean. Then I will come to you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, declares the Lord. Notice the promises that he gives there in verses 16, 17, and 18. They have stipulations. It starts with God giving them a promise. I will walk with you, and I will, or excuse me, I will live with you, and I will walk among you. I will be their God, and they will be my people. God initiates it. He's the one that says, I want to be a part. But then notice, there's a stipulation that goes along with these promises. He says, therefore, because I'm going to live with you, I'm going to walk among you, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people, get away from them and separate yourselves from them and do not touch anything unclean. In other words, I want you to be set apart. I don't want you living like you used to live with, with the pagans. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. Don't go back there. It's a stipulation. I mean, let's face it. When we get married, that's kind of what our spouse expects. <laughs> if I'm going to live with you, if I'm going to walk with you, if you're going to be my husband or wife and I'm going to be... You're not going back there. You don't go dating around. Well, that's what God expects. It's not... It's pretty self-explanatory. You need, uh, he says there in verse 17, he says they need to keep from touching the unclean things, from making themselves filthy. He said, if you want me to be your God, stop getting dirty. Stop getting filthy. You know, there's a reason that people don't put adult pigs in their home. Because it doesn't take long for you to put an adult pig in your home before your house becomes a pen. I found this out, oh, less than a month ago. Well, actually, no, I take it back. It was at Tommy's funeral. We were at the funeral dinner over at the Baptist Church. And somebody comes up to me and says, I know where you live. I said, okay. <laughs> Turns out he was the one that done the electrical on my house. And he said, yeah, I knew old man Connor. Did you know that he used to live in the basement? I said, yes, I did. He said, did you know, did you know that they used to keep pigs in that basement and he lived with them? I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> but it explains a lot. <laughs> One of these days, I'm actually going to put concrete on that basement floor. And once he told me that, it makes me want to do it all the more. <laughs> It doesn't take long if you're going to allow the filth into your home before your home becomes a pen. And God says, I want you to remove yourself from the filth. You're not to be like anybody else any longer. This is why Paul says now in verse 1 of chapter 7, since we have these promises that he wants to be our God, that he wants to be our Father, that he wants to live with us, he wants to walk among us, Dear friends, let's cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit and become mature in our holy fear of God. Let's get clean and let's stay clean. If he's going to be our God, if he's going to walk amongst us, if he's going to live amongst us, let's get clean and stay clean. There, this is the side of holiness that many carnal Christians never understand. This is the positive side of holiness. 
Because it's not about what we give up, but it's about what we gain. It's not about the things that we take off, but it's the things that we find. And who we find. We find when we set ourselves apart, when we stay clean, we are not living like the world. The world looks for, looks for pleasure, fulfillment, meaning, purpose, lots of other things, and they always come up just short. What do we do as Christians? We do whatever it takes to find Him. And then once we find Him, guess what we find? All of those things that the world's been looking for. <laughs> we find intimacy with Him that the world can never find. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, what did it say? Seek me first. And what? Yeah, everything else will be added to your life. And that's what holiness is all about. Holiness is not about what you give up, but it's what you gain. It's not about what you're losing, but what you're finding. And by the way, just for extra credit, notice there in verse 1 what he says that we clean ourselves from. If you've been with us on our Friday nights, or a little bit on our Sunday mornings, we talked about the tabernacle and how it applies to our life. And we talked about the inside of us is the holy place where God dwells, right? And he says here, he says, let's clean, cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates the body on the outside, but also the spirit on the inside. This is all-encompassing. It's not just that we clean up our life so that nobody sees the bad that's on the inside. No, we get to clean up the bad on the inside too. Again, I, I could go down this track talking about the people that say, well, we live in sin, we're thought and deed every day, and we're always a failure as a Christian. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that we can be clean. Body on the outside and spirit on the inside. Okay? Um, if you go through the tabernacle, if you wanted to make it into the holiest of holies, there were several things that you had to do first. First, you had to go through the door. We talked about that on Friday night. That's Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the door. The first thing you came to after you got inside the door of the outer court is you came to the big altar where they burned the sacrifices. Well, we don't have a good enough sacrifice to burn, but Christ is our sacrificial lamb, right? slain from the foundation of the world. We bring his sacrifice to burn at the altar. Once we've done that, then we go to the laver and we get to wash up. And the washing is the washing of the word. And we talked about that again on Friday night too. Once we've been cleansed, once we've been washed, then we have permission to go into the holy place where God's presence is. It's there that we see God's provision in the bread and the wine. It's there where we see the light of his wisdom that he gives to those that follow him. And that it's there in front of you that you finally get to pray prayers before God in the altar of incense. And then you get to be in his holy presence. But anyways, the point is, we cleanse ourselves first. We, uh, we take Christ's sacrifice, then we wash, and then we are allowed to go in. Okay. Verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. We have not treated anyone unjustly, harming anyone, or cheated anyone. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I told you before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I have great confidence in you. I'm very proud of you. I'm very much encouraged. I am overjoyed with all our troubles. If you remember how we've talked about the city of Corinth... The entire city of Corinth was a red light district. <laughs> in fact, in 1 Corinthians, part of the church was a red light district. <laughs> he wrote them pretty harshly saying, listen, you got to change. You can't let these things go on and those things that are going on, kick them outside the church, right? You're doing things worse than the pagans were doing. And Paul says here in 2 Corinthians, I am overjoyed in all of our troubles. I'm very proud of you. I am much encouraged. I had confidence in you. Boy, they must have changed. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. It was in Corinth, the whole city that was a red light district. 
It was in that filthy, nasty, terrible place that God built a church. And every time Paul conversed with them, their, the church itself as a whole was drawing closer to the Lord and closer to the Lord and further from the lives they once lived. You know, we love if you know you get people saved and they're in the mess and the filth and then boom, you know, they're automatically saints and they're glorious and they're beautiful and everything's going right and they're making all the right decisions. But that's not how it works. <laughs> You pull people out of the mess in the mire and they may be cleaned up for a while, but here's a tendency. Those pigs like to go back to the mud. And then you got to clean them up again, right? It's Sometimes it's a process. And Paul says, I'm overjoyed because the process that God was doing in this church was being seen. It was powerful. It's very easy to look somewhere else, and we can say a church, we can say whatever we want, but it's very easy to look somewhere else and be able to accuse them, look down on them, find something at fault with them that they're not doing the way we do. It's very easy to do that. What's harder, though, like we talked a few weeks ago, is to look beyond where they're at right now and to look at the finished product that Christ is going to do in them later on. You know, when we watched that movie last Wednesday night, some of those people were pretty messed up people. <laughs> they were some really weird people. But you know what? I actually listened to two, well, one, that was a product of that revival today, preparing for this Bible study. God took a drug addict, a really bad one, that was on psychedelics, that was doing pretty bad worship, trying to do his best to find out-of-body experiences by his own testimony. And then all of a sudden, he gets in the middle of a revolution and God changes his life completely. Verse 5. For even when we came out to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We suffered in a number of ways. Outwardly, there were conflicts. Inwardly, there were fears. Yet God, who comforts those who feel miserable, comforted us by the arrival of Titus. And not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort he had received from you. He told us about your longing for me, your sorrow, and your eagerness to take my side. And this made me even happier. If I made you sad with my letter, I do not regret it, although I did regret it then. I see that the letter caused you to sorrow, though only for a while. Now I'm happy, not because you had such sorrow, but because your sorrow led you to repent. For you were sorry in a godly way, and so you were not hurt by us in any way. Uh, this is a side note, is we've mentioned it in the past, but I want to just kind of cover it here, otherwise it might not make sense, the story he's telling. Paul wrote, by some accounts, four letters to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians was a response to a letter that he had sent previously. 2 Corinthians is a response to a severe letter that he wrote between 2 Corinthians and, or between first, our 1 first Corinthians and our 2 Corinthians. Okay? So the ones that we have are responses to letters that he had previously written. And the one that he wrote right before 2 Corinthians apparently was much more harsh than the one that he sent in 1 Corinthians. And he was worried how they would receive it. Well, he tells this story, and in writing this letter, he, after writing the severe letter, he sends Titus away to go find out how they received it, because he's worried. He, prompt, he mates with Titus to say that they're going to meet back up in Macedonia, and Titus is going to give Paul a report. In the midst of this, like we talked before, 
Paul is traveling about. He's getting beaten up, left for dead. He's getting lied about. All these terrible things are going on on the outside of his ministry. And then on the inside, he keeps thinking back to that letter. And oh, man. I know it was what they needed to hear, but was it too harsh? Was it too severe? Did I say it too strongly? Well, then he gets to Macedonia and Titus isn't there. This does not help Paul's situation. <laughs> He's even more nervous now. Now, eventually they do meet back up. And Titus it goes on to explain that the, the severe letter was not only accepted, but they repented and it was accepted better than what Paul even expected. And so it brought much joy to Paul. But he was having all of these problems on the outside. I mean, if they're going to stone you and leave you because they think you're already dead, they've succeeded at the job. I mean, it's pretty bad. If they're lying about you, if they're saying you're trying to steal money, I mean, there was a whole plethora of things that they were doing to Paul while he was not here in Corinth. All of that would be bad enough. But then to be worried about all of the people, all of the places that he's been trying to build churches and minister to, that's a heavy weight. It's a very heavy weight. One that, good grief, just, I'm sure Brother Don felt the same thing. Every time you'd get done preaching, you're like, boy, I wish I wouldn't have said it that way. I wish, you know. <laughs> it happens. Paul tells us, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. They hurt, but they help. Paul's words weren't easy, but they were what the church needed to hear. And in hearing it, they received it well. If you're a friend or a spiritual influence, it is your responsibility to speak. Now, there's a way of handling the truth, for sure. But let's just put aside the ability to handle or provide the truth and just talk about the responsibilities of the truth. If you're a friend or a spiritual leader to someone, it is your responsibility to speak the truth because God has placed them in your life that you do so. It's the truth. If you fail to do so, it's not on them, it's on you. God has placed us where we are with those that are surrounded by us to speak truth into their lives. They need our encouragement and our discipline. Sometimes that's not easy to do. Sometimes we have to say things that are pretty difficult. But isn't it better coming from you, the person that loves them, than coming from the world around them that doesn't really care? Here's the other side to the idea, too. When we are confronted with truth, again, setting aside the delivery for the moment, when we receive truth, it's up to us what we do with it. We have two choices to make, only two. We can humble ourselves under its truth, or we can set our jaw and rebel against it. This has nothing to do with its delivery. This has nothing to do with the person that gave it. If it's God's truth, and the Holy Spirit marks it as that, you are responsible to either obey or disobey. If they've said it, even if they've said it wrong, that's not on them. If you refuse it, that's on you. Can people phrase truth better or worse? Sure. But here's the deal. In spite of the, the delivery method, we are all responsible for our actions in relation to the truth that we have received. We like to be able to find fault with the person that gives the truth. <laughs> because if we can find fault with them, then they can say, well, we don't really have to listen to that truth. But that's not what it is. Well, let me put it this way. Do bill collectors let you not pay the bill because you don't like your mailman? <laughs> nope. 
As a matter of fact, even if the mailman loses your bill, you're still responsible to pay it, aren't you? If that's true of the water bill, how much more are eternal souls in God? We are responsible for the truth that we have been given. Now, just before we leave, I want to say one more thing about this little set. I love that the Holy Spirit put this passage in here, as short as it is. Paul writes about the reality of his ministry and mine here. Paul is a normal human being, just like you and I. He was worried that his words could have been too harsh. He was worried that his words would have been misconstrued. And in the process of all of the external things going on being a problem, the internal was also in turmoil. He worried how the people would react to his words, yet God reassured Paul that God and Paul were still working together like we talked about in the last chapter. And God wouldn't let Paul down. Verse 10. For having sorrow in a good way results in repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But the sorrow of the world produces death. See what great earnestness godly sorrow has produced in you? How ready you are to clear yourselves. How indignant, how alarmed, how full of longing and enthusiasm. How eager to seek justice in every way you have demonstrated that you are innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it wasn't because of the man who did the wrong or because of the man who was hurt. Instead, I wrote to you so that your devotion to us might be perfectly clear to you before God. Isn't that so true? The motives of the world or worldly people, when they get after you, it's usually to tear you down or to put you in your place. It's not usually for your benefit. But in godly circumstances, the reason we get on to people is not because we want to put them down or put them in their place. No, the reason we get on to people is because we want to lift them out of the muck and the mire. We want to draw them close to us. You see, worldly people, when they put someone down or they get after them, what usually happens? The people get defensive, right? And it brings a distance. But in godly situations, it doesn't work that way. No, you become more vulnerable and you get pulled into unity. It doesn't say stay down in that hole. You got there. You deserve to stay there. No, it's you throw them a line and you work to pull them out of the muck and the mire. The one, you become better and closer. The first, you become bitter and distant. The one, you pull away, but the other, you pull close. Now, is that how it happens in the church? Unfortunately, not as often as we'd like. Sometimes it doesn't work that <laughs> easy. The principle's great. The practice is difficult, isn't it? <laughs> But see, that's our motive. Our motive is not to put into place. Our motive is not to push away. Our motive is, is to draw close and to lift up and to strengthen. And when you have that heart, <laughs> perfect love casts out fear. <laughs> it gets rid of a multitude of sins, right? The idea is we're trying to do to others what God has done to us. Even though that we were still sinners, Christ still died for us. Verse 13. So this was comforted. This is what comforted us. In addition to our own comfort, we were even more del delighted at the joy of Titus because his spirit had been set at rest by all of you. Aren't you all thankful for God's 
comfort in hard times. <laughs> Paul uses this word 29 times just in this letter. Talking about God's comfort. Verse 14, For if I have been doing some boasting about you to him, I have never been ashamed of it. Moreover, since everything we told you is true, our boasting to Titus has been proven true. His affection for you is even greater as he remembers how obedient all of you were and how you welcomed him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that I can have complete confidence in you. Titus came as a reporter, but he ended up being an encourager on both sides. What a neat opportunity. Paul sends this letter out that's so severe, he's worried that the church is going to disown him. <laughs> he doesn't even go himself. He sends Titus out hoping that he gets a good report. When Titus doesn't show back up, he's worried that they killed him. <laughs> but when Titus gets back, Titus, Paul finds out, was an encouragement to Paul. But even more than that, Titus was an encouragement to the believers there in Corinth. You ever come into a room or you ever see some, I should say it this way. You ever see somebody come into a room and it's like the air went out of the room? Because <laughs> everybody breathes in. <laughs> you see, Titus wasn't that way. <laughs> Everybody came, when Titus came in the room, everybody went, oh, and the air filled the room. Titus was an encourager. Titus strengthened both sides, even Paul. <laughs> and Titus was Paul's protege. We have one of his, one of the letters that Paul wrote to Titus in our Bible. Titus was Simply a child in the faith, and yet his very presence encouraged and strengthened Paul. What happens when you walk in the room? <laughs> I, uh, you'll notice the fans are on and the doors are open tonight. I took the incense that we've been using on Friday nights when we talked about the tabernacle, and I put it in here for Oh, about an hour before service. Uh, just to get that aroma because it's talking about the prayers of the saints and that was what Paul was mentioning. Well, <laughs> it was rather pungent when I came in like 7 o'clock or a little bit before 7 o'clock so I turned on all the fans and I opened the doors because it was pungent. It was strong. It was powerful. Wouldn't it be great if when we came in the room all the people that are feeling miserable and broken and hurt they feel your presence come in and they're excited. They're encouraged and they're strengthened. I'm not talking about a bubbly, outgoing, friendly personality. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being the kind of person that's such a help and such a strength to others that when you come in the room, the whole room is lifted. I mean this wholeheartedly. God help us to do better. Because I'm not... I'm not. I'm a no sense, nonsense kind of guy. I don't like drama. I don't like, I want to just get in there, get the job done, let's do it, you know? And being an encourager is not something I'm good at. I try and I work at it, and I, there's been at least two or three different situations this week where the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, no, don't say that, because that's not going to be an encouragement. Yes, it was to you, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he pointed right to himself because he knew. It's true. The Holy Spirit stopped me and said, that's not going to be an encouragement, so don't say it. So I said it in a different way. <laughs> but the idea is, how can we better be an encouragement to the believers in the faith? They need our encouragement. They need the truth of God in their life. They can find somebody to beat them down any place in the world. But when they come into the church, they need to see Christ flowing through us. Well, I want to take us back just really quickly. 
Um, oops. When Paul told the story, go to the next slide there, Daniel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he, he mentioned it just a little bit, but as he told this story, it had gold on the inside of that story that I just wanted to cover tonight because it was a, very, it was a great encouragement to me. So I want to go back and I just want to pull this little bit of truth out of uh, Paul's story here. In verse 5 of chapter 7, he says, For even when he, we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We suffered in a number of ways. Outwardly there were conflicts. Inwardly there were fears. Paul had problems on the outside. He had problems on the inside, worrying about these churches. He'd been beaten, threatened, lied about, thrown out of towns, left for dead. That's all just the outside. And man, I'm over here whining and complaining about, you know, <laughs> what I'm doing, right? And then to have the fears on the inside. And I, I do, I just love that they had that in there. But then look what it says in the very next verse. In verse 6, it says, Yet God. i got to tell you, I'm really thankful for the yet God moments in my life. In the middle of the outward struggle and the inward spiritual struggle, the God who comforts the miserable sends a message to Paul. I've been beaten up. I've been left for dead. I've been lied about. I'm just trying to minister. I'm trying to preach the gospel. I'm trying to get people saved. And all of this stuff is happening. God, what are you doing? No, Paul didn't say that. I probably did. All of that going on and then the inward. And more often than not, the inward is worse than the outward. Yet, God. God's so good, isn't he? I love that characteristic that Paul gives there. Like I said, I love it when, when Paul goes into the little quotes and he does it a lot in his passages. <laughs> he could have just said, yet God comforted us by the arrival of Titus. But he didn't. No, he gave us a characteristic of God. Yeah, Yahweh that comforts those who feel miserable. <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit transparent with you tonight. You know how we've been going through the greatest commandment in our sermon series? We closed up this last week. Well, we've been talking about the inside to love God with all of our, our thoughts and our heart and the decisions we make in our mind. Well, all throughout this time, I was battling pretty hard a fit of depression and fears. And there was lots of different factors. But I was failing at what I was preaching about. You know, hey, we're all a work in progress, right? <laughs> Man, I'd throw out one thought or one fear that was, not, or one thought that wasn't godly or, or a fear that I had. And no more than I'd throw that one out and the devil would throw in another pig in my mental ring and I'm trying to wrestle it out and I wrestle that pig down and I throw it out and here comes another one and it just kept happening over and over again. When I feel defeated, I don't go to find help as I should. I go to find shelter. And I go, and I'm a terrible boxer, I go in the back corner of the ring. Because I can control two sides. I can't control all around me, but I can control two sides. The problem is it just gives the devil a better target. Just being transparent. So I was feeling really defeated. Trying to do better and just keep getting hit. And it translated into actions where I retreat into my cover corner. And to make a long story short, Sonny and I get a letter in the mail. A letter that I had picked up in the mailbox, and I looked at it and I said, ugh. 
I didn't even want to open it. I threw it on the counter and I left it because it was just one more thing in the middle of that week. Well, Sonia does the same thing. She picks it up because she sees who's it's, who it's from. And she's like, oof. <laughs> so she leaves it there on the counter. By this, it had been at least half a week, if not a full week. See, the thing was, it was from a creditor. And we didn't want to look at that credit. We didn't want to know how much we owed and how much they wanted from us. But Sonia, in her cleaning frenzy, as she often does, she finally decided to open that dumb letter. It turns out the creditor wanted to give us a credit. How many times does that happen? Now, I'll be honest, it was a substantial amount of money. A substantial. It was a miracle. But it didn't really matter to me the amount of zeros that were on that page that they had credited us because it had God written all over it. I was feeling miserable. I was feeling defeated. And God sent a Titus through the mail. Out of nowhere, God showed up and in a massive way showed me that he was still with me at work. Just when I needed it, he was there for me. And I'll be honest, if he did it for me, where I was at, he'll do it for you too. I don't know how many times I've considered stopping the whole online thing. I don't know how many times I've considered just not putting them on YouTube because it takes an immense amount of time to do that. And invariably, drives me crazy. Every time I go to stop, that week, somebody comes up to me or they send me a message and says, oh, I just want to tell you, I was catching up with some of your Bible studies and, and this one, the last one was Michelle. She, she was watching the end of the book of John and she'd put that one off forever and it was exactly what she needed at the time. To which I said, thanks Lord, I'll keep doing it. <laughs> Invariably, every time I'm in the darkest fight, he comes through. He is a God and his character is to comfort those who feel miserable, of which I am one. So did you come tonight feeling miserable? Or maybe you've fallen on this video sometime down the road online? And you've been really struggling? Are you broken and empty? Are, are you fearful for what's coming in your life? I want to tell you. Yet God. The God who comforts those who feel miserable. That half sentence tells us a lot about God. It says yet God. That means despite the circumstances inward and outward, God still has the ability to do something above and beyond what we are capable of thinking. That means that God, we know that with all things, there's nothing impossible for him. So it doesn't matter the situation on the inside or the outside. Not only does he want to work, he is capable of working and doing above and beyond what we could expect or think or ask. He is the God who comforts the miserable. He cares about how we feel and wants to do something. The God of all creation, Yahweh himself, wants to comfort you. He cares about you and your situation. He wants to change the struggle you are in. Because he is the God who comforts the miserable. It is in his character to do so. Are you miserable right now? Jesus said of himself, go ahead, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. 
his first sermon to the world. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to tell the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set oppressed people free and to announce the year of the Lord's favor. This same God is here for you in this moment to comfort you now, to give you hope to free those who are in chains, to give sight to those that can't see, to give freedom from those who are oppressed and captives, and also to tell you God's favor is coming. You're probably thinking, boy, Pastor, I wish. But that's for those holy preachers out there. That's not for me. I want to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6, Paul said it is God's nature to comfort those that feel miserable. So if you're feeling miserable, it's His character to make you feel better. It's His character to comfort. It's not about your hope or your prayers that bring the answer, but who God is. It's not about your ability or your lack thereof. It's about his character and his ability and the lack there or and the power therein. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, it's Jesus' nature. And it was the reason that he came. Finally, if you don't think this one's for you, one last passage. Daniel, go ahead. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. It was Jesus that said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and loaded down with burdens, and I will give you rest. Place my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble and will find, you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is pleasant and my burden is light. How much is all? All is all all the time. Will you come to him? Friday night we talked about the story of Hannah and the reason my daughter is named Hannah is because God answers the prayers of desperate people. If you are feeling miserable, if you are feeling defeated, if you are struggling, if you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, I want you to know it is in God's character to bring you comfort now. He will hear you. And in your desperation, he will answer. Let's pray. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon, and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.